go to New Zealand. You know where New Zealand is? I'm sure you know. They're very near to Australia. Okay, <laughs> right? And I'm very happy to have my colleague here, Dr. Ben. I'm sure my, some of you have met. He was here uh, two days uh, running the workshop. He's a research methodologist. He's an expert in research methodology. All right? So I'm sitting here just to help out and stuff like that. Now, I was a staff here in UPM for quite a number of years in faculty of modern languages and communication before I moved on and, and both of us are attached to a department called the Higher Education Development Center. And what we predominantly do is we are academic staff developers. <coughs> okay, what that means is we mentor and guide the academic staff. All right? So in the, in the sense that when we have new academic staff, we tell them, look, this is how you chart your career path. How do, what do you do? What are you expected to do as an academic? And, and, and I think a lot of new academics who join the academia usually are, they are lost. They do not know, what am I supposed to do? Or do I just go and teach? Why is it that my friends, oh, within five, six years, they're already professors, and how come, you know, I'm not somebody, how come my friend gets to go for conferences? And I don't get to go, how come my friend is being invited for so many things and I don't get a chance to go? You see, there are a lot of things around there. Or the things like, what is it that the university recognizes in an academic? What do they want the academic to do? What are you supposed to do? So these are the kind of things that we do. And, 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 and in my case, what I do is I do a lot with postgraduate supervision. Okay? So I train supervisors who teach the PhD student. So I, that's what I do. I train the supervisors. I have some workshops. I think next week or something for the supervisors on how to give feedback, how do you do the deal with uh, students, emotions dealing with students, you have international students, you have local students, what are the dynamics? You know, sometimes you have a situation where the supervisor thinks that they are a boss and they think that you are a student. And when you're a student, that means there's a, there's a different kind of a challenging relationship. So these are some areas. Besides that, what I also do is, I do a lot of workshops for postgraduate students. Okay, when I was here, I started the Plus Agenda program. That was about 10 years ago. But now you see this developed into such a big program. And the University of Otago, we have an MOU with UPM as a member of Understanding. So we come here twice a year and we share our expertise. Ben and I research into this area. Yeah, I research into student development, postgraduate supervision, feedback practices. Ben and I do a lot of research on research methodology. For example, how do your lecturers teach you research methodology? Is it their job to teach you research methodology? Is it the job of a supervisor? Or is it the job of Ben to help you all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Ben, he will sit there 24-7 on the computer and help you. you know, we have I think uh, last year alone we got quite a bit, right, Ben, of students yeah, writing to Ben asking, you know, I'm from UPM, can you tell me what do I do? And we were thinking, what is your supervisor doing? Yeah, shouldn't your supervisor be guiding you along that line? You know, so we provide that kind of a survey. Sometimes students, they write to me, they say, you know, I'm having a problem with my supervisor. So what's the problem? No, my supervisor is bullying me. <laughs> now, how is the supervisor bullying you? My supervisor asked me to write the paper. When I finish, he said, put my name first. That has happened, right? Very right? common. So how do you deal with it? So we need to tell the university, look, follow the Vancouver protocols. You know, things along that line. So these are some of the things that we do and we disseminate, we research into the field. And both of us are also <coughs> members of professional bodies that look after these kind of areas. We have what is called the Higher Education Research and Development Association of Australia and New Zealand. It's called the HERSA. We're actively involved with that. I'm involved in another organization called the International Doctoral Education Research. It is based in Montreal, Canada. So we come up with policies and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do today is actually to, you'll notice I'm not going to use any PowerPoint, not for this workshop, because I'm not comfortable with PowerPoints. I prefer to have discussions. Okay? Sometimes when you have too many PowerPoints, the PowerPoints dictate what you're doing. It's not the other way around. So I, I want this, this seminar to be more for discussion. You ask me the questions, you share with me all the experiences. Because I think that's where learning takes place. And I think this is a lesson that you need to take back when you become a lecturer. Okay? You are not just providing information, 
but you are encouraging reflection among your students. Thinking. Okay? So before we start, okay, I think it's best that we get to know one another. So if you could just briefly introduce yourself, tell me who you are, which country you're from, and are you an academic staff? Alright? Are you an academic staff? Or anything interesting you want to tell us about, about yourself? Can we start with you? You need to speak louder because you're going to be a lecturer. The students need to hear you. Let's see if we can hear them. Just kidding. Okay. Yeah? You are? Kulut. Kulut come in, okay? Yes. I am from Iraq. Iraq? Yes. BSD student and biotechnology and biomedical science. Uh, the area that I'm interested in is project analysis. Okay. Uh, actually, I work with bacteria and. You work with bacteria? And I don't like bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> you work with bacteria. Okay, that's it. Keep the bacteria in your cell. I don't want the bacteria. Alright. Okay. Him during lunchtime, if he's around. Okay? Yeah, you. Oh, so, okay, okay, it's alright. Very respectful of you. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Ahmad Lord Russo. I'm um, also a PhD student from the Faculty of Modern Languages and Communication. Oh, okay. Yeah, my area is on communication, specifically on public relations. Public relations. Okay, you should work with Najib, man. <laughs> Oops. Alright, <laughs> okay. okay. My name is Abdullah Kegama, a Nigerian. I did my master's uh, at Modern Language and Communication, English Language. English Language, wow. Okay, so great. Uh, I will ask her to type since she's from education. I'll ask her to type, all right? She said, okay, all right. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Moni Cheng Li from Faculty uh, of Education Studies. Sports. Sports. Wow. Okay. Sports person. I'm UIB from Upsi. Uh, Upsi, all the way from Tanjung Malay. Uh, okay. PhD student. Sorry. Yeah. And what, what is the area at PhD? Uh, teacher competency. Teachers competency. That's something that Ben will be interested to. Okay. All the way from Upsi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
studies. Studies? FP, FP, yeah, right? FP, right? Yes. FP, right? Yes. 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 Yeah, you need to have more of such gardens here. You <laughs> you know, it's not only the lecturers, but I think a lot of the students are also very stressed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So when you're doing a PhD, this is a person to see. What about you, sir? Yeah. Uh, so good and very good morning. My name is Adivira Bhutra. I'm from, uh, I'm a PhD student from International Research School, UTM. UTM? Yeah. Kuala Lumpur. Oh, not the one in Skudai? No. Uh, UTM, I see. Okay, all right. You need to look at the website because you've got the name right. It's too long. <laughs> How long have you been there? How long have you been in job? Around three or four years. My God. <laughs> <laughs> when you graduate, make sure you know the name. Make sure you talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm doing the yeah, nature choice of the symbolic. I see, okay, great. Okay, you? Uh, my name is Marcus. Uh, I'm from NTP also. I'm currently doing my uh, research on concept map. Concept map, concept mapping. I see, okay, yeah. Concept map, mind map, there's difference, right? Okay, great. Yeah? So we seem to have quite quite a variety of people and stuff like that. That's quite interesting. Okay. Ben, you want to introduce yourself, Ben? Again. Again. <laughs> Not many of them know you. <laughs> my name is Ben Daniel. I work at the University of Otago. Uh, my areas of specialization are uh, research methodologies, all kinds of research methodologies. Um, and that's also the areas that I teach currently. I am educational technologies and computer scientists and training. And I work in many areas. Yeah. So any research methodology is the right person to ask. All right? Okay. I think we will start off the session. Can you just help me to type something here? He says he's typed slow, so I presume you type fast. Because you spoke faster than him. <laughs> it's okay. I was hoping that I could get a whiteboard here, but, but the thing is that there's no whiteboard here. Let's open the I really want the word. Okay, one of the first questions I want to ask you now is, why do you want to be an academic? If you're an academic, why are you still in academia? What is it that makes academics so interesting? The reason you are here is because you, you are thinking of probably, or you're already in, or you're being an academic. Why? What is so interesting about being a lecturer? Why do you want to be a lecturer? Because your mother said so. <laughs> Why? Why do you want to be? What are some of the things that, that, that attracts you to be an academia? Sharing knowledge. Sharing of knowledge. You sure? Okay, no, my share. <laughs> you, you, so you, you think okay. like that you want to serve society. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Serve society. Okay. I, I, I want to ask you 10 years from now whether you still share the same sentiment. Okay? okay. To share knowledge, okay? Others? It is a very simple question, you know. You will not get this kind of simple questions in your waiva. So just give me some quick answers, please. Sorry? Career improvement. So you think that it's a very secure career? Uh, yes. Yeah. Secure? Yeah. Janji dapat pension. <laughs> okay, alright, okay. That means you'll definitely get the pension. Okay, that's great. Secure, it's a secure career. However, it's not a secure career all over the world. Remember that? Okay. To be young and energetic. Sorry? To be young and energetic. To be young and energetic. You're saying that looking at me and Ben. <laughs> we look young and energetic. But you must understand we work in our place, we don't have the stress garden because we don't we don't need the stress garden. But you are here, look at all your lecturers, those who have taught 30, 40 years, do they still look young and energetic? At least they are mixed with I mean they are in a group of young people. 
Oh, so, so okay, okay, I, I get your point. What you're saying is that by being a lecturer, you get to mix with young people. So when you get to mix with young people, you feel young at heart. Wait till you experience them torturing you. <laughs> when they send you some written work, the first two lines you get headache. You think it is intergalactical English. <laughs> okay, right? And then, yeah. It, it will be respected in, in your community, in your society. To be respected in your community. Wow. So when you go back, everybody must, the minute you go to the airport, everybody will call you, doctor, please come. Wow. That's interesting to be respected. Also understand, because you have a DR in front of your name, when you go for weddings and you want to give money, because you're a doctor, you're going to give higher weight. <laughs> so that's respect too? No, that's part more. So. Okay? Because you're a doctor, right? Because when you go, you know, you expect all the royal treatments. So when you give, if now you give $20, when you have a DR, it has to be at least 100, man. That's, that's a sign of respect, right? Okay, that's what you want. Okay? That's interesting. <laughs> Others? Yeah, maybe that's, you want to be a change agent. That's you want to be a change agent. Yeah, in the sense that maybe you had a very bad experience when you were doing your postgraduate work. So now you are into the field so that you make changes. You want to make the changes wonderful. That's, I share a similar view like you. Okay? It's to be an agent of change. You know, because you have gone through an education system, you feel that this is not the way to do it, let's do it differently, and you want to make that change. Great. Others? Develop in, uh, investigation, investigation skills. Develop investigative skills. That means you want to, if I rephrase it, you want to develop critical thinkers among your students. Myself. In, or yourself, okay, yourself centered, okay. <laughs> self centered. Okay, that's all right. Okay, develop critical thinking skills for yourself and also for your students. Okay? Okay, that's great. You should put your, your mask first. Yeah, you should put your mask first before you start doing anything else. Yeah? Good job. Good job? High salary. High salary, wow. High salary, really? High salary? Yes. Ask every, every. And also, they don't stop in one area for all the time. They should be progressive. Excuse me. Okay, so this is a field you can progress. So there's, there's, there's career opportunities. There's, there's a lot of career opportunities, okay? And this? New, new knowledge, to get new knowledge and stuff like that, okay? Okay? Anything else I should think of? Why do you want to be an academic? I think also to satisfy one. To, to, to Sorry, satisfy I can hear To satisfy one's curiosity. Satisfy one's curiosity. Why don't you become a doctor? Yeah, because uh, everyone has what he feels. He has, he, he feels satisfied when he do. So you are going to be satisfied by being a lecturer. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, now I think we have, we have given quite a lot of uh, reasons that many people will use to become an academic and stuff like that. Now, uh, some of the reasons that have been written in, in the literature, I'm just referring to my notes to, just to highlight some of the things, is that a lot of us become academics because, like many of you say, you want to serve the community. Some people say it is a calling, okay? Some people think that, look, this is a skill that I've got and that's what I want to do. Of course, there are a lot of benefits of being a lecturer, okay? You get all those perks, you may get, well, a stable pay, okay? You may get good pay, good pay in the sense that you're able to live a comfortable life. You cannot be rich and famous, okay? That's something that you can't be. You get to travel. Okay? This is probably the only job in the world where you can, where the university or your employer pays you to go and present a conference for 20, at a conference for 20 minutes. It's the only job, lecturer's job. Yeah? We can fly all the way to Canada, just talk for 20 minutes and everything is paid for. If you're lucky, you get to go for two or three trips a year. So if you become an academic for 30 years, just imagine every year you go to two countries, Okay? By the time, at the end of the career, you would have visited 60 countries. It's not bad. 
Nice, a good job. Okay, and if you're luckier, people already know you, like me and Ben, they'll invite you over and over again to other places. Okay, so that's one of the perks of, the reason why people invite you is because of your expertise. Remember one of the points you say is that because of the, the critical thinking, you become an expert in your field. So that's where you begin to show off those ideas. All right, so those are some of the things that I think are important for, for an academic. Ben, do you have, what is the reason you became an academic, Ben? Myself? Yeah. <laughs> well, as I said, I was in the corporate, I was uh, in the health system for a number of years. But before that, uh, I've been teaching primary, secondary, intermediate schools a long time. So um, after having taught for many years, I went to the industry, and I realized that actually what I perhaps can do better is in academia. So I feel in yeah. academia I can contribute more. Yeah. Okay, so we also have a lot of people, even in UK. I do not know uh, any of you know Dr. Kenny Teo. So yeah, our supervisor. your supervisor. Yeah, he's one example. He was from the industry, okay, and now, and he's by the way, he's one of the best lecturers in UPN. You know, his, his classes you go, you just come out laughing, right? It's, it's very good. If you have a chance, go listen to his lectures. Yeah, the opposite thing some lectures that go back to the company speed. Yeah, yeah. So what's the reason behind this? What's the reason behind? They're fed up of academia. Okay? You have heard the good points of the academia. Some people, they find the pressure. Okay? Like, the uh, thing is, they're, they're recording my conversations. If not, I can be very open. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I need to be very cautious about, okay, I need to be very cautious about saying, I wanted to compare, okay? I'll just compare two systems. Okay? I was a staff here. Okay? I was a staff in UPM, and now I'm working at, 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 at a different university. Now, the reason I left is not because I don't like UPM. I left because my family was there. Okay, so let's get that right, okay? I'm not saying UPM is bad or Tango is good, no. That is not that. That has been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is that when I talk to my colleagues here, they find the pressure. Okay, what is the pressure? Number one, if you're an academic, you have to teach about 12 hours a week. Okay? You have to teach 12 hours a week. Here in UPM, your teaching means you have to teach maybe three courses or two courses, okay? Maybe one undergraduate course or two uh, masters or PhD level, something along that line. You have that. Now that's already about 12 hours. Some people will get to teach only two courses and you have another four hours, stuff like that. Now, besides that, you have meetings after meetings after meetings to attend, okay? Now, as an academic, the most important thing that you have to do is to publish, right? Is to publish. If you are working in a corporate sector and I want you to publish, I have to make sure that I give you the facility or the time for you to publish. Does that happen here? No. The reason I'm telling you no, like in Otago, both Ben and I, we get one research day off in a week. The so one day in a week, we don't have to. We, we, have, we don't have to attend any meetings. We don't have to attend anything at all. It's our research day. Nobody can disturb us. We can work from home. Most of us work from home once a week to do our research because the university says research is important. At the end of the day, that's what we are going to value. Okay. But here, nothing of that sort happens. You do research at your own time. Now, when the priority is research, why isn't in your workload? Why isn't that included in your work workload? That is the pressure, okay? On top of that, the pressure to publish, okay? Of course, we all want to publish in, in good journals, top-notch journals. The reason you want to publish in top-notch journals is because you want people to know your work, okay? You want people to be familiar with what you're doing, who you are doing. The pressure is there. But I do not know what the pressure is in UPM now, but you are expected to publish a lot in ISI journal. ISI, ISI. See, there's a lot of literature that questions ISI. Okay, there's a lot of questions. So, when you're asked to publish three papers a year, four papers a year, five papers a year, how are you going to do it? So, when you have that pressure, it says you need to go to that garden that you're talking about. Okay, that is very stressful. On top of that, which I, I'm still trying to change in UPM, which I've not been able to do, I don't know when it's going to happen is, if you are a lecturer and you supervise four students, you do that above your 12 hours. 
If you have meetings, you have research, everything is, is not included in your timetable. In Otago, no. If I have two students, our workload is included in the teaching. <coughs> so there's no such thing as above and over. So when things are balanced, when things are balanced, you feel as though you are doing the right thing, you're working for the right reason. Okay? What you are doing here, you are teaching, you got meetings, you have this committee, that committee, this and that, on top of the supervision, and then you have to do research, and you cannot do, and when you cannot go after four or five years, you cannot get promoted, you feel the frustration. <coughs> so when you come to that point, what do you do? That's when you leave. Okay? You find that, see, but you see, you cannot blame UPN because the instructions come from elsewhere. Okay? Because everybody wants to be on the QS rating, on the THE rating, and every university wants to do that, so they start pushing. And when the push happens, what happens? The students become the victims. Okay? I'm a lecturer, I need to publish three papers a year. I can't do it alone, I got PhD students. Okay, I remember the last time when Ben and I were here, we were running this preparing for academic career workshop, and there was a one professor and you know he published a lot. So we asked him the panel, I said, how come you publish about 20 <coughs> papers a year? He said, I have about 17 PhD, I, I got 17 students, what's the problem? We are wondering, okay, what is the link here? Then I saw, oh, fine. So the students are doing the work, and you are being a co-author or even maybe a main author. So what happens, he said, if you are the lecturer and you have to publish so much, what do you do? You have no choice but to get the help of the students. Working with the students is fine, but abusing the privilege is wrong. But you see, we hear more of the abuse than the working. You see, so that's one reason people leave. Okay? If you are working in an environment like what Ben and I are working, I'm not saying that we are the best system, but you see, I think in Otago, we take into consideration a lot of things. Okay? The lecturer has to teach, you need to supervise, you need to do research, you need to go for conferences. That, that's a sort of a balance. Things are different, people will say, I will stay, ben, ben and I will stay, okay? I know many of my colleagues, they enjoy working here, they like that kind of a thing. But some people may find the pressure. So you end up leaving. Are you planning to leave? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, if you plan to leave, make sure you leave for something that will give you something better, okay? Just one minute. And to me, I think, Better doesn't only mean in terms of the dollar sign, but I think better in terms of more quality time with the thing that you love the most that is being with your family. If you get a job and they expect you to do work from 7 to 9 p.m. and they pay you three times more, I wouldn't take the job because that means it's less time with my family. And we always say family comes first. But here it's so obvious that money comes first. I'd rather be here work from about 8 to 5 and I can go home and be with my family, maybe I earn less but I'm still happier. Yes. So it, 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 it's a balance. It's a balance, sorry? Well, actually, what you're telling me today, telling me, is contradict to the first impression I get because I'm not from academia. Okay. <laughs> I come from industry. Okay. And this is why I'm here, curious. Uh, one of the notions I've been told that uh, lecturer and university have some uh, amount of autonomy so, um, like for example, like the system maybe, like you said, the reason some people might not satisfied with that. Yeah. Then, I thought that the university can, yeah. you can have freedom to adjust your system and let you can have True. Own. You see, that is a wonderful thing about talking about autonomy is it's in paper. Okay, it's in paper. You see, here you must understand, I think our, the way our universities work is, we report to a ministry. Okay? All universities report to a ministry. We've got a ministry of education. Or, uh, yeah, I think it's a ministry of education now. And when the ministry says, look, this is what we want you to do, then the amount of autonomy that you have is limited. Okay? When the ministry says, look, this is the kind of publications we want you to have, we want you to have this many publications so that our QS ranking goes up, what do you do? you got to push yourself. Another thing, we need more international students. Fine. I think about five or six years ago, we had, I think everywhere you walk in, in, in UPM, it's all the Iranian students. They came in plain loads. Wonderful, it's good. But you see, if you are a supervisor, the, the faculty are there, oh, you've got six students now, go to supervise them. 
And you are asking what is this? I can only supervise two students at a time. Six students. I have to teach three courses. I need to do this, do that, and six students. What am I to do? You see the point. So you see, so a lot of things, well, you see, I'm sure if the university has a total autonomy, they will definitely listen to what the lecturers' rights are going on. This has been an ongoing affair. Okay, let's, let's, yes, sorry, then. And I think there's also a misconception. that says that uh, when it comes to the hierarchical system, Malaysia is number one in the world in terms of hierarchy. Boss tells you, you, you listen, you don't question. Power distance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the power the, 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 yeah, it, it, it's exactly that that's how it happens. You see, I mean, just in terms of a simple example of comparison, here, you know, I've seen so many letters, you know, official letters come, they say, attendance is compulsory. Especially for meetings, you know, we, we will never ever get that in Otago because if that letter comes, it's a violation of human rights. You cannot force people to do anything. You send me something and you say, I want it today, I say, duh. <laughs> today, you want it now, say, where was your planning? I got other things, I fully plan to do something else today. You want, I can do it, but let me check my calendar or three weeks from now. You are rushing, it's your problem, not mine, you didn't plan. Mm. There's no such thing as, you know, last minute, get this done now, nothing to do. So I think that there's a lot of variations, you know. So sometimes what we do here, sometimes it's very difficult to justify because the instructions come from so many places. You can't blame the vice chancellor for asking things to be done because he gets the instructions from there. Okay? He is responsible to the cabinet, you know, so many factors. You know, sometimes people become overzealous. You know, and then you start pushing, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you know. I do not know whether in Oopsie do you uh, thumbprint when you go to the office or do you clock in? You clock in, okay? This is a university, you know. What about in your industry, do you clock in? Yeah, but we have flexi, flexi time. We have flexi time, okay? Okay, uh, uh, I think, you see, you'll be surprised that kind of a thing never happens in so many universities in the world. They don't believe that academics should clock in. Then there's no academic freedom. Okay? Academics don't work 8 to 5. Yesterday, Ben worked up to 3 a.m. Where to clock in? <laughs> in the hotel room, clock in the hotel room. So, so sometimes when you come up with these policies, what is the rationale for that? You see, I was, I think, uh, the last time I came, I was, uh, I went to what's the name of the university? And and when I had the conversations with the with the, with the academic staff, some of them were new new uh, just finished their PhDs, which many of them are going to be, and they were telling that look, in this university we have to wait three years before they can supervise the student. I said what? They said no, that's the policy of the university. I said who made the policy? They said no, this and, and somebody was there who was in that decision. I said how did you come to this decision? Kept quiet. I said, you know, in most universities, before you make a decision, you have to research. Find out why, why is three years, why two years, why one year? What is the program for that? So I, I asked him, in these three years, what do the academic staff do to become a listing? Oh, uh, they, they, they learn on their own. That's wrong. What do they learn? I said, what do they learn? In many universities, what happens is that if you just finish your PhD, okay, and you join my faculty, I will tell you, okay, I'm going to appoint him, He's a senior professor. He will mentor you for six months. 
and he will know exactly I need to teach her how to supervise, how to give feedback, how to talk to the student, when the student gives this, this is what I do, then there's a list of things. Once you have done that, he will tick, 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 and he say, okay, she has already finished six months, now she can supervise. That means there is support available. And how does this support come from? From research. From research. You cannot just go and say, look, two years you cannot supervise. I'm, what about doctors, man? Housemanship. That's training, right? Induction into that. Uh, yeah, housemanship. Lawyers, chambering. But for academic stuff, nothing. You finish PhD, you're supposed to go and teach. You don't even know how to teach. Mm -hmm. Because they say you have a PhD, you can teach. Who said so? <coughs> you can teach. So where is the training for teaching? Just because you have a PhD, does it mean that you're a teacher? No. And are you an expert? No. You only know your research. Even that research methodology is questionable. Yeah. <laughs> and then you want to go teach. Give your PhD to Ben, he will tell you apart and you want to go teach. You know what I mean? It's difficult. So that is the, the difference between, you, 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 you see the disparity there. That is a disparity. Yeah. Yeah, that's apart from mentoring, you said that if you have a new PhD, that maybe you are attaching to a professor. Right? That's apart from the mentoring aspect, is there any a kind of guideline, maybe a kind of gold standard that, okay, that we follow? No, I, I don't think there is a world standard because I think each university, each, each country has got its own national agenda and stuff like that. You see, but you see, there's a lot of, lot of guidelines that you can put it in. You see, like one of the things that I would, if, if I were in a position, I would say, look, you definitely need to have mentoring in teaching, okay? So in Otago, what we have is we have what is called peer mentoring of teaching. I'm currently involved with some students, some some lecturers, and we have got a commerce in, in University of Otago. I go, I sit behind, and I see them teaching, okay? And after the teaching, no, before the teaching, I would see them and ask them, look, what are you going to teach? You got one hour, what do you want to achieve in this one hour? Let me have a look at your notes, your slides, whatever. Let's discuss. Okay, okay now you go and teach. So I observe, I make notes. After that, come, let's go back. Let's discuss what you did. The one hour will spend. Following that, the person is supposed to do a reflective journal. Think back what you did. If you had to do it again, what will you do? We discuss. Five to six times, you will learn the art of teaching. I've seen some lecturers, they just stand like that and they teach. I said, you know how boring it is to just stand like this? Why don't you move? Okay? Some they have slides like this words, you know, full. Full. I said, you've got a big lecture hall, the students can't see this. Okay? You have a 40 minutes lecture, you have 120 slides. How do you teach? No, I want the students to know. They say, do you have to tell the students everything? Why can't you ask them to read and come and discuss? That's better learning. You don't have to, it's not information, provision of information, but it's more of discussion. Very serious. So how can you be so serious? Okay, every teacher, every person who comes in front is an entertainer. Yeah, every lecturer is an entertainer. If you cannot entertain, don't be a lecturer. Okay? If you come in front and you say, I am the boss, you are the student, you listen to me, forget it. Okay? Will you, I mean, if you, if, if you, I'm just asking you, if you're teaching in a class and you find a student sitting in a class and texting, you're giving lectures, he's texting or he's looking at his iPad and what will you do? What will you do? Okay, let's ask the guy from UC, what will you do? You're going to see Pandilic can right? Okay. What? Okay, you just give us an answer. I mean, we're just having a frank discussion. What will you do? Will you get offended? You know, you are taking all the trouble, the student is looking at the iPad and you know, read that, read that, or never ever reading this paper. What about you from Nigeria? You say, uh-huh. Oh, no. <laughs> you send him out of your class. This is a different thing, huh? You kachi hati, pejamne you pada ai. You kachi hati, you send him out, and then what will you do in your country? Nothing. Sorry? Nothing. You don't mind, right? No. You want to read this problem? What? You're from the industry. But what will you do again? If I, if I find him, I will go to him and ask him, what's so interesting you are doing there? 
Can you mind to share with us? Yeah, and, and he will tell you, look, what I'm doing is more interesting than what you're teaching there. <laughs> so what's the problem? You know what I mean? Yeah, the reason I'm doing this is because I find you boring. Yeah. So why don't you leave the class? I don't want this in an icon room. Why should I build the sun? <laughs> you see, that is people's rights, you know. You know, you want the touchy attitude, that all doesn't happen. Like in Otago, the same thing happened in Urban. You know, parents can bring their children to the class. Yeah. Because they don't know, there's nobody to look after their baby. They can bring the kid and the kid sometimes cries. I've seen a lecturer who goes to the kid, carries the kid, carries the kid, he came and he started lecturing. <laughs> will you do that here? Oh, I'll come out the newspaper. <laughs> Malaysia kidney will come out, okay. You know what I mean? It's different view. If that guy is doing something else, clearly it means you are not doing your job. Yes. That is an indication. And that is his right, what he wants to do. Okay? I'm. Looking at the iPad, what's your problem? Am I disturbing you? I'm not disturbing you. I can stand up and start dancing, then it's fine. I'm not disrupting you. You see the point? Okay, so that is a perception. So depending on your different culture, you may chase him out, but I don't know what's going to happen. If he'll say, okay, I'll go out, I'll wait for you to come out. <laughs> I'll wait. You have to leave that. You're already safe in the compound, right? You come out, we'll see. <laughs> You know what I mean? Okay, any further? Uh, those of you who just came, can you just introduce yourselves, please? Uh, Your name and where you're from? Me, me from uh, Yemen. Yemen? Oh, Yemen, okay. You're from Yemen too? Yeah. My name is Umar. In the ring, okay. Anybody else? Is it here? My name is Umar. Sorry? Uh, Umar. Umar. Master Sudan. From, from UPM, okay. Anyone else who just came in? No, okay. Yeah. yeah. My name is uh, Muhammad Abu Bakar. From? I'm, uh, from Nigeria. I'm from Faculty of Human Ecology. Human Ecology, okay. That's, that's great. Okay, any further questions from what we have been discussing? Yeah, I don't have any slides, but we have discussed quite a lot of things. This is the way to learn. Okay. Now, I think one of the reasons that, that, that you are talking about autonomy and, and what Ben was telling, I think that is the best thing about being an academic. There's a lot of autonomy in the sense of what you research and what you write about. You see, when you write a paper, when you want to disseminate it, nobody is going to, your head or department or your team is not going to say, hey, come and show me what you are writing. You cannot write something against this. You know what I mean? So you have that academic freedom, that, that, that autonomous in the sense of your integrity in terms of, in terms of knowledge dissemination. That is something that you can do. Okay? That is why many people want to teach. I can come and teach you here. I don't have a syllabus, I don't have a structure, but we are generating based on the ideas that we have. Now the other thing is that there's flexibility of, of, of what you call the working practices. Okay, what does that mean? You know? There's a lot of flexibility being a lecturer. Okay? There's time for you to teach, there's time for you to go for conferences, there's time for you to do a lot of things. Okay, but but you see like what you said in UPC where you have to punch in and stuff like that, that sort of effect a little bit of your flexibility. Okay, you cannot just so you punch in at eight and you punch out at five. Eight to five. So in between can you go out of campus? Can no problem. I mean actually cannot love but you can go. <laughs> okay, I get the point. Okay. But so, sometimes you may even be out of campus but it's already clocked in. <laughs> that is wireless clocking in. <laughs> Remote. <laughs> Talking in Jara <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay? And the other thing is that I think one of the best things about being an academic is you feel as though there is this global sense of community. You know? Like Ben is an education technologist, he's known all over the world. He's got communities all over. He can go to anywhere and he can talk about education technology. People are into that area, they'll come. You talk about wireless, wow. There'll be some people in South Africa talking about wireless or some, some people in Canada, that's your community. So it's a global community, people know you. Okay, so that is one thing. So you're recognized and for you to be recognized, of course, you need to publish and you need to go for conferences and stuff like that. The other thing is that, one of the best things I say is that it's traveling and meeting people. Okay, that's one of the best jobs. You can travel. Okay, many people want to become you can get research grant. Take the research grant, you can go and collect data. Ben and I travel a lot. I think February, where you went, Ben, Zanzibar. 
Zanzibar and Uganda. Uganda. He went to do research because he wanted to do some memorandum of understanding. Yeah, I was in Oxford University this year. A UK travel, all paid for by the taxpayers of New Zealand. <laughs> Yeah, but when you go there, you present people know you. Wow, okay, this guy, okay, great. And you meet all the people and you feel good. Well, you travel to so many places. So that's one of the best things about traveling. So what happens is that, just talking about traveling, the sense is that universities, they allocate money for you to travel simply because universities see the importance that you disseminate your knowledge to the international community. Okay? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in, in UPM, if you are a new academic, for the first three years, you get to travel every year, once, for international conferences. But after the third year, you are supposed to, I think they give you only about 80%, the rest of it you can try to get from research grants. I do not know how it is in your own countries, but in some countries I know they say, look, because we don't have a lot of money, maybe two years once, then it depends. But you, you definitely get, get a chance to travel. Okay, some, some countries they say, look, we can't give you everything, but we pay you, okay, $5,000, rest of it you can top up. So there's a lot of opportunities to travel, and of course through this traveling, you get to meet a lot of people too. Okay? Now, any questions from this about being... Any further questions? Anything else that you want to discuss? So we have got a few ideas about what... Yes, sorry. Oh. I, I, I don't think you mentioned about your reason to join the oh, why I? <laughs> <laughs> My reason why I wanted to be a lecturer, yeah. I, I always like to come in front and talk to people. I think that's a gift that I have. Okay? My, parent, my father was a teacher and, and I never thought of becoming a teacher until uh, once I finished my studies, my father filled in a form for teacher training. I didn't know, he just filled in, he said, look, go for teacher's training. He said, okay, fine, I went and I liked it. And I became a teacher, and I know when I go in front and I talk, people like it. So, I, and, I don't know, maybe, I know some people have got that thing, and so I thought, okay, fine. And I was teaching just like that in a primary school. I started teaching in a primary school about 30 years ago. Primary, secondary, then I went to UPM, and I, I finished my, 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 I served in Malaysia for 30 years. When I retired, I got a job in Otago, so I went there and I actually, but I don't teach as much as I used to teach here because in Otago we do a lot more research. Okay? I love teaching. I like to talk to people. I like to share, make people uh, well, learn new stuff, make them feel happy. <coughs> yeah, you, you gotta make, when you're a teacher, you gotta make people feel happy. You know, they say people forget what you say. They will forget what you do, but they will never forget how you make them feel. So I like to have that feel good feeling. <laughs> TV7. <laughs> feel good. <laughs> you know, the feel good feeling. That's what you do when you go to a class, you go to Kelly's class, you come out, you feel happy. You feel where is his next class? Some classes you go, oh my god, next week one more time. Come on, guys. You know what I mean? So that is the whole thing, and I think I can do that. When people come to my class, they laugh. I like to see laughter. I've also got a PhD student who's, who's studying humor in the classroom. She was following me since my undergraduate days. She said, no, I want to study humor. She's doing a PhD in Otago now. That's why I wanted to become a lecturer. Because you want to make the change. Make people and to quote your reason. You know? I went through a different experience. Okay? I hated exams. I hate exams. So when I became a lecturer at UPM, I said for my course, there's no exam. No exam. I never give exams for my students. I think examinations are a violation of human rights. <laughs> no, seriously. No, Ben will disagree with me, but you know, for me, you see, it's simple. I'll give you my rationale. Okay? I teach writing. Yeah, and I said that the university schedule the exam writing at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday afternoon. 2 o'clock afternoon is your worst writing time. You come and sit for the exam, you fail the exam, D, and that is written in your script for the rest of your life. Isn't that a violation? 
That means everybody knows you got D for writing. But is that D reflective of your skill? You ask me to write at 2 o'clock, I can't write. Try 9 a.m. in the morning, see what I get. You know what I mean? So, I never give, I don't believe in exams. I don't believe in it. So I say, I, I give the students, okay, look, in writing, I'll give you a few tasks. I give you five. I'll mark the five, I'll take the best two, and that is your grade. That is more fair, right? Right? Fairer, right? Fair, yes. Is that allowed? Why is it not allowed? That's called autonomous. <laughs> Autonomy. I'm the lecturer. I am the one who assess your learning, not somebody else. It's my job to see. This is my learning objective. I want you to know A, B, C. Have you got that? Take, take, take. Okay. But I think it's also a sense of responsibility. Yes. If I'm come to you, so I'm to So if you learn the exam, you try to make sure that what you're actually taught me is understood, not that you have to punish me. Assessment is all about assessment for learning or assessment for teaching. But I share the same method with you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Only that I don't know in Malaysia whether we can. I, I did that in Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> I did it in UPM. Wow. I said no exam for my exam. The Jabatan said, I'm teaching the course, I want to give exam. I can explain it. I said, so how I'm going to give the exam? I want the students to go out to KTM, I want them to observe, I want them to write what they see. I can't understand they come and sit at 9 o'clock, there's no train comes to the classroom. Yeah, so you, you can justify. You can justify because, yeah, you had a question? Yeah, so what uh, I wanted to, to say is in some clients found that if, let's say you're given five questions, for them to certify that yes, you know the field, you have to answer those five questions. There's no option like answer three. So it's possible that you don't know those two and you will be given a certificate that you... No, you see, any certificate, any certificate of competency doesn't mean that you know 100% of everything. Okay, you have a PhD now. Okay, when you get a PhD, can you say, look, I got a PhD, I'm an expert. You know everything about a PhD? There are things you know, there are things you don't know. You see, you, you, you may know, okay, research methodology, you may know. You may have done qualitative, but have you done all aspects of qualitative? Maybe you have just done on GT, for example, grammar theory. Other aspects you do not know. Does a PhD mean you know everything? No. It's the same thing. You have passed your TOEFL. Does it mean you are an expert in English? No. It means for that test, you managed to answer that question, you only know that thing, not everything. So a certificate doesn't mean anything. Just like, I know some of you will ask for a certificate after attending this workshop. <laughs> what does that mean? Nothing. Honestly, it means nothing. Come on, man, I'm in an interview board. You know, the only people who will send certificates of participation is people from here. I attended this, I attended... So what? You could have attended, you could have been sleeping in the class, so what? That, that doesn't mean anything. You go for a conference, attended a conference. So easy to get. You just go for one session, go collect a certificate, and you go around the country. So what does that mean? You attended a conference, so what's the big deal? You attended the conference, fine. What have you produced? Where's your paper from the conference? Where's your productivity? So don't believe in all this certificate of participation, all this. It doesn't work. That's the trend now, even in admission. Maybe they will say you have to get GP 2.3. And it's possible that somebody that got 2.0 is even better than you. That you True. Have. You see, the, the, those, those are called entrance examination, which is fine. But you see, when you are in a university, it's a different kind of a setting for you to assess learning. It's a completely different environment. This is called assessment standards. Okay, assessment standards are if I want you to learn A, B, C, I have to teach you A, B, and C and I have to assess you. If you can do A and B, you cannot do C, then as a lecturer, I have to give you more guidance so that you get that C. Okay? Just that you want to become a doctor, they want you to learn how to give an injection. The first time you give, you fail. They won't say, okay, you failed. You can be a doctor, but you cannot give injection. <laughs> you know? They will train you until you are able to give the injection. You make sure you know where to poke, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you need to know that. Okay, you want to go and cut somebody, you need to be 
Hundred percent sure before they give you the, the doctor's the certificate or whatever. That doesn't happen in a PhD. You go to Viva. They ask you fifteen questions. You can only answer seven. Others you cannot answer. They say okay, never mind. Minor correction. You do it. You get it. nobody knows. You couldn't answer so many questions. You still have a PhD. Okay. Does anybody know when you get your PhD, yours was uh, revised and resubmit? If you return the PhD in bracket revised and resubmit, <laughs> nobody knows. Or with minor correction, nobody writes there. Then why do some of your friends get so emotional when they get you know uh, resubmit with major correction? So emotional. Nobody knows. It's not written in a transcript. What's your problem? <laughs> Just go revise. Finish. I mean, you want to get emotional, just take a screenshot and put it on Facebook. See how many people like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Become more emotional, what's the problem? You know what I mean? True or not? Okay. So that's about academic freedom. Alright? So traveling and meeting people. Yeah, when you travel, you get to meet a lot of people. Uh, people know you, especially when you publish. You know, when you publish, people really know you. Okay, that's the most important thing. People recognize you. Ben and I are invited here because of publications. Okay, we also go to the other universities in Malaysia. They invite us because of what we have done. They see the research we're doing, the findings we have. It makes sense. They know that we can come and talk to students and get things done. That's how it works. So that's one of the best perks of being an academic. Okay, any further questions before the mee goreng gets cold? Oh. Have I bored? Bored anybody? You mean me feeling bored? Uh, in my career, I think uh, feeling bored is something that, that that it all depends on the kind of students you have. You see, you cannot be hyperactive for thirty years of your life. Okay, there are times when you 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 got you got your own pressures, you got your own circumstances, you have things that are happening. So it's not that you feel bored. You see, I do not know. I mean, I tell you my own experience. When I go to a class, I feel very excited. Okay? You get excited. You get excited. Why? The minute you go to a class and you say something, you see people looking at you and smiling at you, meaning, voila, I've got them. The minute you've got them, then you get more excited. To me, when students ask me questions, they ask questions, wow, get more energetic. But right now, I'm a bit hungry. <laughs> so, yeah. So, feel board is it, it happens it depends on the kind of students you have you know and I think you have a group of 30 students you cannot be bored with 30 of them there at least be half of them who are there they come to learn they want to listen to you okay you cannot bring your emotions to the class and show the emotion that you're angry don't even know this stupid it's just like uh, I must tell you this story of Gandhi Sorry that I have to repeat this story. This was a story that, that when I was at Oxford University, you know, you're presenting in front of all these uh, white guys, you know, those are the people who ruled us before. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so I was talking to them and I was telling them this story about Gandhi. Gandhi actually did law there in, in UK and stuff like that. And uh, he was in a class and there were a lot of people in his class and he was the only colored person in the class. So there was this professor who did not like him. Because this professor is a real serious man. Then, okay? real serious man, and when he goes to the class, everybody will look down. They're scared of him. But Gandhi, you know Gandhi, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talking as though you are. You know? Gandhi is the one who look up. So the professor didn't like him. Okay? So what happened was that uh, after some time, there's, uh, there's all this argument in the class between him and Gandhi. And once I think they were going for lunch, so Gandhi took his food tray of food, was looking for a place to sit, he couldn't find a place. Okay, and then he only found one place that is beside the professor. So he had no choice, he went and sat beside the professor, he looked at the professor, the professor looked at him, stared at him, the professor told him, pigs and birds do not sit and eat together. <laughs> Gandhi said, it's okay professor, I will fly away. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, okay, I will fly away. It's okay, professor. So, who's the bird and who's the pig? <laughs> you know what I mean? And after that, 
and this is a class of law, you know, law class. He went in, and and uh, and the professor is talking about values, moral values, how you should be, you know, stuff like that. And they said, let me give you a scenario now. You are walking on the streets, and you find two bags. One bag is full of money. One bag is full of wisdom. Okay, which will you take? Okay, so I ask everybody. Everybody said, I'll go for wisdom. I'll go for wisdom. I'll go for wisdom. Yes, Gandhi. Gandhi said, I will go for a bag of money. The professor said, I've been lecturing you for one hour, and yet you want to go for money. Even if it was me, I will still go for the wisdom and not the money. And Gandhi said, you are right, professor. You can only take what you don't have. <laughs> so Gandhi doesn't have money, he takes money. The professor doesn't have wisdom, he takes wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, and the professor got so angry. <laughs> got so angry. Okay? And then the, that was the exam. Then a written exam. Written exam. So he wrote the exam and everything. And Gandhi was a very intelligent person. So when he wrote the answer, so he marked everybody. And finally he marked Gandhi's paper. The answer was super. Okay? No way he could mark him wrong, anything like that. And Gandhi was very witty. He marked the papers, everything. And finally the professor got so angry, he just wrote that. He did on the last page. He wrote the idiot. So when he gave back the paper, everybody had marks except Gandhi. So Gandhi took the paper, the professor was sitting, he went in front, excuse me professor, you signed your name, you forgot to give me the marks. You <laughs> 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 what it's mean? You see? You get those kind of students, you can't send them out of the class by then. <laughs> You are going to be in the number. Yeah. <laughs> you are going to be in the You get it? Okay, so that, that's how the things happen, yeah. Okay, so boredom, boredom is actually something that you cannot go to a class, you cannot bring the emotions to the class because you are going to waste the collective time of so many people. You cannot do that. Okay, you, that is your responsibility. Okay, that is your way. You cannot go there, don't call people stupid, don't, don't do that. People are there because they genuinely want to learn. If they are not learning, they feel, they feel bored, it's your problem. You are not doing a good job. When you go for lectures, some lectures are so boring, right? Yes. Okay? You see, your problem is a lecture's problem. It's not good. Like, I've been talking to you for almost one hour, you know. Did you feel bored? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel bored? No. Why? Because we are engaging. Okay? We are taking your views and stuff like that. I think the, uh, the other thing is that, you know, in academia, uh, when you teach, you teach people about what you know. So if you know about the subject, you don't teach them. You don't teach them. Students are learning about it. So if you're not uh, energetic about the subject itself, how do you expect other people to be energetic? You can't be here. Uh, so. yeah. Okay, shall we take a break? Okay, we'll probably get back here about 10.50. If I'm late, please wait. I need to go and send Ben to FBNK. He needs to go and interview some people. And I'll be back here. I will look for the room and I'll come. <laughs> it's quite a big building. Okay, so we should, I should be back later by 11. Yeah, I'll go and send Ben and come back, all right? Let's have a lot of food there, free. You get more by the taxpayers of Malaysia. Please come. <laughs> and if you have any questions during that time, please uh, write it down. Okay, thanks a lot.